Okay, uh, we are going to speak about some critical aspect of psychiatry which relates to brain-related <clears throat> diagnosis in psychiatry. I will state my conflict of interest, which is related to a startup that is being promoted but is not really happening yet, and it's preceded phase. And I'm going to talk to start my talk about uh, an example of a clinical case uh, typical to psychiatry, which can exemplify the need for uh, brain-related diagnosis in psychiatry. Let's take a, a clinical situation where a patient comes to the psychiatrist and says, doctor, I'm sad, I'm depressed, what do I have? The clinician would say, the psychiatrist would say, you have a depression. The intelligent patient will think to himself, I just told you that. What added value can you give me? What more can you tell me about it? And the psychiatrist would typically not have um, much uh, to say in addition to, to this type of diagnosis. And what do I mean? I mean, if we compare it to other fields of medicine, for example, you go to a physician with stomachache. You say, doctor, I have stomachache. What do I have? You expect some kind of diagnostic process in, where, in which at the end you get a diagnosis, for example, appendicitis. Appendicitis, appendix is a place in the body and it is infected. So the diagnosis, the name of, of the illness is the cause of the illness. Cause of the illness means it's an etiological uh, diagnostic entity. While in psychiatry, when you say depression or anxiety, it's not a location in the body and it's not any kind of mechanism. It is just plain complaints like stomachache, like depressed, which is a descriptive uh, diagnosis of the symptoms and the signs. And why is that? <clears throat> this is because in psychiatry, we don't have an etiology. We don't know the causes of mental disorders. And this is very, very critical because the efficacy of our treatment depends on knowing what's wrong with the patient. If you don't know what's wrong with the system, with the mechanic, with the car, whatever, then how would you ever fix it? When you say appendicitis, you know where to go. It's a place in the body. You go to the appendix, the intestine, and you know what to do. You have to extinguish the infection. But if you don't know, if you don't have a theological diagnosis, you don't know what to do. So this is really, really critical in psychiatry, and this is actually the next uh, needed revolution in psychiatry. Now it is possible, I will argue that it is possible to do it today, because today we have enough data from neuroscience, and especially from a field related to neuroscience called computational neuroscience, which is out there, and it is mature enough in order to start using it to generate a brain-related etiological diagnostic approach, diagnostic system, diagnostic conceptualization for mental disorders, okay? Now, I will go in a very, very quick pass uh, with all the knowledge that we have in computational neuroscience, just touching it a little bit like a bird fly, and then I will try to merge these two fields that exist, the computational neuroscience and psychiatry. You just need to merge them in order to make the next leap to a diagnostic, uh, theological diagnostic system in psychiatry. So what do we know about the brain? We know, everyone knows that the brain is hierarchical in the sense that we have unimodal, multimodal, and transmodal processing. So auditory, visual, and so on are integrated and then integrated and integrated. And today we are talking about a connectome, a whole brain connectomic, an uh, entire brain organization. And we are presenting it here as a network. These units could be uh, neurons, they could be regions in the brain. And as you can see, when you have a global brain organization in green spread out, then each time the brain organizes as a, as a whole, you have an emergent property of consciousness. So you have conscious, unconscious, and consciousness is actually very important to understand this concept of emergent property. It's a property of the whole brain that doesn't exist in the element. So the sum is more than the elements. And this is critical in psychiatry because mood, consciousness, and highest mental functions, they are all emergent properties 
and they all require whole brain organization. Today we know something very interesting about the brain. We know that the brain is organized as a small world network. Small world network means that nearby regions have dense connectivity, as you can see here, and far away connections have less connectivity. This is an efficient information processing system for networks, which is universal. Uh, airplanes, the internet, social networks, they all have this pattern. And this, the brain also has this pattern, and it is very interesting because we can begin and, and conceptualize a pattern of brain organization just like EKG. You have an arrhythmia that causes cardiac insufficiency, and you can have an arrhythmia that causes brain insufficiency that actually causes the mental disorders. So this is a very important thing, and it is also a dynamic organization of the brain. The brain can move from balanced a small world network organization into higher connectivity or lower connectivity, nearby connectivity, and thus becoming random or fixed. So the brain can be unstable, becoming random, disorganized, disconnected, fragmented activity, which we all know we have in psychosis, for example, or it could be fixated and limited and reduced to a number of situations and, uh, and minimal uh, activations like in negative symptoms. So you can see how it begins to connect to, to clinical phenomenology. Another thing that we know about the brain, which is very important, and this is literature developed by Carl Freestone from UCL, talking about a Bayesian brain. Bayesian brain meaning that the brain continuously predicts what is happening in the environment and adapts to it. And how does it do it? The brain actually generates an internal model of the environment and always updates this model and the difference between the model in the brain and the actual events in the environment is called delta or free energy. So if the brain is adaptive and can, go, can do a good adaptation, good presentation, then the free energy is reduced, the delta is reduced. There is match, a good match between what is happening in the environment and what is represented in the brain. And this is very important for the brain to be able to act in the environment, adapt to the environment and be, and contain its stability. And this process of, of, uh, of prediction of the environment is done through a set of global brain organizations, which we, were, we know them in recent years called Executive Default and Salius Network. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. But what is important to understand that the brain optimizes the happening in the environment and represents and adapts to it and represents by reducing the free energy, the difference between the environment and the... So there is total, a dynamic of optimization and optimization. The optimization when there is mismatch and optimization where, where there is a big, good match. Now, what is that to do with psychiatry? It has to do with psychiatry because, again, we are going to talk about an emergent property. I will argue that the emergent property of optimization is elevated mood and deoptimization is the depression. Okay, so if the brain is matching the environment, then the, there is satisfaction and elevated mood. And if the free energy and the delta increases, and there is deoptimization, then there is depressed mood. It's also very intuitive if you think about it. For example, you have an internal representation that you need to succeed in an exam, that you want to succeed in an exam, and you fail the exam. So the distance between the internal representation and then the occurrence in the environment is, has grown, the delta has grown, the free energy has, has become bigger because there is a mismatch, you failed, you didn't succeed. And if you succeed in the exam, then there is a reduced free energy because there is a good match. And if you succeed in the exam, it's accompanied by elevated mood, by satisfaction. If you fail, we, it, it correlates typically with frustration and uh, depression. Okay, so now how does this relate? We know mood, mood, and we know something very strong about mood. We know that antidepressants and other brain stimulators are synaptogenetic. They increase the number of spines and dendrites in the brain. They make the brain more plastic. And we know that this is an antidepressant effect where the plasticity increases. Now we can understand it in brain-related terms. If the brain is plastic, it's more adaptable. If it's more adaptable, it will adapt to the environment. If it will match the environment, it will reduce the free energy. 
reduce the delta, and we have a satisfactory elevated mood effect. So here is the linkage between what we know happens with antidepressants and, uh, and this Bayesian brain dynamics. Last uh, of these heavy figures is um, internal representations are actually very custom. The brain evolves from childhood to adulthood, becomes more small world network, becomes more organized. So you can see that it is becoming from dense connectivity, which is not a small world network, into a small world network organization. And the brain represents the environment, it represents the body surface, it represents concepts as assemblies of neurons, and actually the, <clears throat> the brain generates a model of psychosocial interactions. It has an internal representation of the person himself, of his friends, family, everyone he knows, and he can simulate in his brain what he would do if he tells his friend something, how will he will react. He can make simulations of what's happening. And these interactions, interpersonal interactions, and their patterns and style are dependent on the evolving experience, experience-dependent plasticity in the brain, which generates these things, and psychologists call it object relation psychology, and this determines the, the traits of the personality. So personality would be related to the internal representations. If they are matching, if they are flexible, if they are not biased, then you act properly in the psychosocial environment, and you succeed. So and you don't have a personality disorder. If they are biased, you had bad experience, bad representation, then you have a mismatch and you don't function well in a psychosocial environment and that would be a clinical manifestation of personality problems. So now we have these principles. We have global organizations and we know that we have executive, salience and default mode network. We know the executive network acts very quickly, decision making, working memory and so on. We know the salience network has to do with adaptability, with the Bayesian dynamics, and we know that the default mode network is a network at rest, which probably represents all these internal representations and internal objects uh, that the brain can, assumes and uh, a model of the environment. We know that the brain functions on time scale, millisecond range, week range, and lifelong uh, plasticity. And we have this system here where the executive network interacts with the environment directly. The default mode network represents the environment and there is a mismatch or match between the representations and the salient network has to do with this adaptability. So having that, we can begin and take the phenomenological diagnostic system of the DSM and build upon it a brain-related diagnosis. Let's spread out the whole phenomenology spectrum of psychiatry, starting from schizophrenia down here, anxiety, depression, and personality. And we can generate a vector of phenomenological manifestation of this patient. And then we are dividing it into time scales. We know that uh, psychosis like delusions, hallucinations are millisecond range activities. So that would be a time window of millisecond activity. We know that uh, anxiety has to do with five to 10 minutes uh, panic attacks. And we know that depression changes into antidepressant effect in a month, month and a half, like weeks and months. And we know that the personality is shaped in a scale, time scale of lifelong experience. On top of that, we relate to the time scale, we relate the network, the global brain organization, the executive network relates to the millisecond range, and then the salient network relates to minutes to weeks and uh, months, and lifetime development of the default mode network is the last uh, uh, feature in this, in this profile, which is for each patient has, has a different profile. Now we know the dynamics, we know that the small world network is important in the, in the second range, we know that interacting neurons are important in, in network organization and stability, which has an emergent property of anxiety, we know that the Bayesian brain has to do with depression, and we know about the internal representation of uh, personality disorders. So now we actually have a correlate of the phenomenology of psychiatry related to a brain known dynamics. And this is not proven totally, although there is a lot of literature talking about 
disconnection dynamics and small world network in uh, psychosis, but it has not been proven totally yet, so it's not used yet. It is what we call a testable hypothesis. You can now uh, interview a patient, diagnose the patient, generate this profile, and this profile will give you a testable hypothesis to what is wrong in his brain. So now when you're going to do an imaging study or imaging assessment, you know what to look for. In schizophrenia, you look for time scales of milliseconds. In depression, months and weeks. In uh, personality disorder, lifelong. And different networks. So you know the coordinates in space of a location and the time scale, and you have an etiological redefinition, reconceptualization of mental disorders. How do you prove it? We live in a technological era. The clinician can gather the data on his computer. The patient can have an app and report his complaints. And we have magnificent uh, consumer user in imaging devices like Muse, like an EEG with dry electrodes and wireless, and sensors of different kind of artificial intelligence who can sample the patient's behavior, activity, and cyber activity, and extract from it the phenomenology. We can now build on that to generate the profile of big data of many, many patients in the cloud and begin to validate it using a consumer EEG where the patient can put it at home and generate big data. If he puts it three times a day for one hour, you get many patients like that, you get big data. Big data of profile, of phenomenology, testable hypothesis, and validation with the EEG. Today, you can also combine new types of medications and treatments. We have direct medications, which are the typical consensual medications that we have. And we have direct interventions in the brain, TDCS, TACS, different technology. I won't, I won't talk about that here. But now you know, with this frame, you know how to combine them and what to do. So it gives you some kind of advantage, even before it was really proven, to try out more effective combination of uh, therapies. You can control the experience of the patient using virtual reality, which is, uh, controls the senses. And with comb this combination might improve and actually could improve uh, some of the interventions that we have until today, even before we have actually uh, validated this whole system. We have a neuroanalysis society. And neuroanalysis would be a this reconceptualization of, of mental disorders or brain disorders. And we have already a, a big group of psychiatrists, like 200 psychiatrists are using it. And of course, you are welcome to join. All you need to type is neuroanalysissociety.org and uh, join us in our activity. Thank you very much. I hope I was in time uh, to finish this. Uh,